Hey everyone and welcome back. So I've already made a few videos on like LogSeek and introductions, but I haven't actually started it from the top. And I realized that a lot of what I'm saying is probably making a lot of assumptions about base knowledge of LogSeek. So what I've wanted to do here is like really go back to basics. So when I started LogSeek, there was a lot of videos on Rome, obviously, but I still feel that there was a big gap in my understanding of like how I should put these things into practice. So, so I've separated this into two parts. Um, in part one, it's going to be very theoretical, very, very theoretical. So if you don't enjoy that, maybe skip this one and wait for the next one. Um, but also just feel free to skip ahead using the timestamps. I've, because it's a long video, I have decided to obviously split it in two so that it's not too much because one of the things that I struggle with is when a video goes over 15 minutes and I know this one definitely will. So yeah, have a look at the timestamps and I hope it helps you. So some of you would have already seen that I've done an introduction to LogSeq before. So what is different with this one? In this one, I'm really aiming to suit it more to a complete beginner. So starting with the real first principles and building it up into how I got to where I am today in terms of my knowledge graph. And this is why you'll see here, there's like a lot of these foundational principles. So the difference between top down versus bottom up, understanding the journal and the graph, the design principles that I'm trying to follow, I think that's very important. And then should I use the journal or a page to enter the information? So that's the scope of this first video. So getting into it, the difference between top down versus bottom up. So traditionally, when you work on our computers, we're working in folders. Everything has to have hierarchy and that requires a top down categorization. So we have work and then personal and in work, we have project one, project two, project three. In personal, we might have documents and past projects and, you know, planning materials or, you know, just like random repositories of whatever you might have in a personal folder. And, and that is very much, as I said, the hierarchical way of thinking. And the problem with that is that everything happens in silos and you have to remember sort of what you were thinking when you put the information in there. And if you don't have a good structure, it's super easy to lose things. When I started migrating everything over to LogSeq or my personal notes, I discovered treasure troves of things that I'd written down before and just hadn't actually ever revisited. So why is that now different? Because LogSeq and, you know, Roam and other network note-taking tools use a more of a bottom-up approach where everything is centered around nodes of information which rely on this backlinking. So, you know, it doesn't require you to have this perfect folder structure and remember everything. It is able to search or you're able to collect information around certain topics or tags. So why has this been such a game changer? Because my memory, my, 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 my working memory, when I put things in folders and files, whatever, is terrible. I, I always think I'm going to be able to find it again later and I just never am. So I'm going to get into understanding the journal and the graph and it's going to be very, very slow and foundational. So please feel free to skip ahead and um, see if there's any other parts that might be of interest to you. So when I open LogSeq in a browser window, this is what I encounter. It says, hi, welcome to LogSeq, and then all this information. Now, what I want to do is I want to open a database or create a new database. So if I go here and I say open, let me just go to my desktop and choose my demo. Now, you can just create a new folder for your, for your database. Select folder. Yes, allow LogSeq to view files and allow LogSeq to save changes. Okay, great. So this is now my journal page. The journal page is the starting point for everything. So you can start entering anything into your journal. But the way that I want to explain this is by looking at the graph. So if I go to the top right corner and I say view graph, it takes me to this page, which is all the nodes of information in LogSeq. All these nodes are pages and we'll get into that now. So if I go to my journal and I just enter things, it's just like, this is a random line. This is what I would call a block. And if I press enter, I go into a new block and then I can, you know, enter say, this is another block. Now the, the block is the core functional unit 
of the LogSeq database. I'm, I'm going to do it an injustice when I explain it, but it's the basic building block of your knowledge. So every piece of information is a block. Now pages are a different type of block. Let's look at pages. So if I want, just first I want to draw what my graph looks like. So my graph, if you remember, looked something like this. Okay, great. So if I want to enter a page, let me type page one, what happens in my graph? It enters a new page or new node, sorry, page one. Cool. So now I can carry on typing and I can, I don't have to, it doesn't have to be the first line in the block in here. It can just be random. So I can say there is another page called page two. And that creates another node in my graph. So that is page two. Okay, let me erase this little thing down here. Now, you can see there's nothing that is linked yet. And this is because everything is happening in the journal. However, if I now go into one of those pages, so let me go into page one. If I now enter in this page, a link to page two, so page two, what happens is I get a connection in my graph. So that is how your knowledge becomes linked. So now let me go into page two, or let me create another page called page so if I enter page three on page one, it creates another page linked to page three or another node for page three. So, and it links that to page one. Now, if I go into page two and the easiest way for me to do this, with the software that I'm using is just to go control U and go page two. There we go. Scroll down. You can see that there's a link. It's, it's got these linked references here, which is in the journal first, and then also a linked reference in page one. So this should be page three down here. Now, if I wanted to link page two and page three, all I need to do is type page three in here. And that will create this final link here. So now if I go to my graph, if I view my graph, you'll see there, there's the same triangle that I created. So that is how linking works in the graph. So this is pretty basic stuff and it's just around creating links between information. So I can also do that using a hashtag. It creates the exact same feature. So let me create a page four now, oopsie, page four. And that also creates its own page. So if I now go to my graph, you'll see I have those other three connected and page four is this little lone wolf over here. So another thing which is really nice, maybe not directly related to the journal on the graph, is that you can use the sidebar, which allows you to split your screen and they will work in two different places. If I go to page two on the left side of my screen by just clicking that, and how I got the page four on the right side of my screen was by shift clicking, you can see I can enter in page two and I can enter in page four at the same time. So let me actually make a link between page two and page four. So page two, there we go, creates a link here. And you can see it automatically links that to page twos here in a linked reference. Okay, so that's the basic premise of this, but this really unlocks a lot of power. So 
we've 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 touched on those two topics and just using the sidebar that's more of a practical thing that you can work in these different areas at the same time and and they're all interlinked okay this part here the design principles that i'm trying to follow is one of the areas where i really went wrong in the beginning i didn't understand what i was actually trying to do and all the videos that i watched there's some great videos by you know guys like shu omi nat Eliasson, that spoke about just start writing, just start entering your thoughts and that just did not work for me and I, I, I struggled with it for a few months before I actually like really invested the time to learn what I was doing and start putting structure around these things and even now I'm constantly revisiting my process when I have time. And the way that I like to think about it is that every different method has its trade-offs and the things that I'm trying to solve, to solve for are these five things and it will definitely evolve, it's not like it's my five five steps to success with LogSeq, but just getting into the middle of it. For me, it's it's easy searching and resurfacing of notes. And I think that's, you know, again, to the to what I spoke about network note-taking, that's one of the key principles of network note-taking in general is being able to resurface notes and not have them hidden below folders of hierarchy. Okay, so my second point is a bit of a strange one. It's a usable graph view, which gives more weight to important topics. Now, this actually links to point, all the other points, but I want to be able to use my graph to go and find information. I think a lot of people don't really think about the graph. It's not really part of their workflows and they don't really care. So it just becomes this cluster of information with like lots of links and whatever. I, I for some reason, aesthetically, I just don't like that. And I like to have things ordered and I want to be able to use my knowledge graph as just that, a knowledge graph that I can use it to go find the information. And then decoupling inputs and outputs. So why have I used the word decoupling? I don't want to separate it so that I'll never be able to find the source or whatever because one of the beauties is that you can link information, but I want to be able to separate what I'm taking in, so from input perspective, and what I'm putting out. And the, I'm using my knowledge graph to do that. And I'm, I'm hoping to make a, a video in the future about how I'm doing my personal knowledge management here because I really want to see sort of the the nodes of information in and then the nodes of information out and then I can pick up those loose threads and just go where my heart desires. So the fourth principle is removing clutter and I, I think it just speaks to the aesthetics of you know the usable graph view. I want to try and have a big junk folder so Sonke Arons speaks about this in um, his book, Smart or Taking Smart Notes, I think it is. It's a really good book. I didn't think that it would be that valuable because, you know, I watched a video and with him and Tiago Forte and then Tiago Forte has a very nice write up and I'll link, actually link to that below. But reading the book was quite valuable. And I think for me, one of my lessons is that I have a lot in junk um, that just like, gets put in there but never gets processed. So one of my, my desires is to actually process information as it comes in. And then another design principle is trying to make my my process quite frictionless. So for me, ease is not actually the goal. Like if something is too easy, it, you, you, you might not even do it, but it mustn't be too difficult to overcome. So, you know, adding a little bit of information, is it's, it's difficult to a sense, but if I just had everything in templates, which is a way that I've sort of evolved, like I used to have everything in templates and now I'm trying to like have more generic things in templates that I then have to input data and in so that I actually remember what I'm doing. So this is all really very theoretical, but getting into practice, it's it comes down to questions like this. Should I use a journal or a page to enter the information? And for me, this was really like, I. I wish I would known this earlier because I just put everything in at random and just started putting links and it, it was so messy. So I've made a presentation which will hopefully address this topic a little better. Should I use a journal or a page to enter information? So I've evolved my use cases quite a bit recently. In my journal, what I'm putting is micro inputs. So that is tweets, short articles, YouTube videos, even podcasts, anything that is like quite small and you know very quick to input then everything else i dump into my journal as well random thoughts to do's notes from calls and then irregular meetings and you'll see why i've used irregular meetings there so on pages 
what I use there are the macro inputs. So books, long articles, anything which is quite weighty and dense. And then my recurring meetings I also put on pages so that, you know, meetings that we have with the team, I have all the notes for those meetings very easily accessible. So there is a little bit of hierarchy that comes in with that or a little bit of structure more than hierarchy. So finally, I also put all process information there and that's output. That's output that might be for publishing or just output that is synthesized thought. Okay, but how do I get to this? And I think this is a more important thing, which is what are my filters and, and how can you adapt those for you? So my first filter is frequency of entry. So for the journal, it's when, when entry is very frequent. I mean, this is where I'm in most of the day and it's just, you know, as I said, dumping thoughts. So pages where things are very infrequent. And then second filter is what is the weight of information? On the journal size, I just use bite size information, which or just very minimal input. Whereas on the pages, it's very chunky or dense, like, you know, this book, the meetings, the process stuff, it takes a bit more time to, to put that information in there. The third thing is accessibility required. So, you know, if there's no structured workflow, or if there's an irregular workflow, I just put that in my journal. But more and more so what I'm doing on the page side, I'm driving predictable workflows using pages and finding that information a little bit easier. And then the fourth one is the coherence of output. So I've said that I'm using my, my output on pages, but if I've got like random thoughts of stream of consciousness, I put that in my journal and I just use the tag fleeting. So it's a fleeting thought. And then when I process those thoughts, I will use the tag permanent. And then just a final note, I like to create pages at will. I think tags are a super important part of the process. So coming back to the log seek side, so how and why I use pages for tags. So I said they use pages at will. And I think historically I was like, no, I don't want to create too many pages. But for me, it really improves the searchability of information. Now, this is in the journal, so it's not creating clutter in your in your or between your lines and your graph. But there is the one downside of having many pages is that what it does create is a bit of an asteroid belt around your knowledge graph. But that's not the end of the world. What that looks like if I just zoom out here. This is that asteroid belt that I spoke about. And all of those things are pages which haven't been linked. Having the asteroid belt used to annoy me, but now I'm just, I've, I've made peace with it as it's part of the process. And as I said, it doesn't create clutter and those tags may be useful in the future for other reasons. So this has been a very theoretical video. If you've watched to the end, well done. Let me know how it was. I'm interested to see if this sort of theory approach is, is useful to anyone. So in the next video, which will hopefully come out next week, I'll look at a little bit more of the practical side because this one has been very long and very theoretical.